Okay, so this example is about angular momentum. In fact, it's really two related examples. We've got one example on translational motion and a second example on rotational motion. The translational example is quite simple. It's simply a block experiencing a constant force. The underlying physical process, the underlying physical idea that you need to apply is nothing other than Newton's second law that the change in the momentum of the block is equal to the net force applied to the block times the time over which that force is applied. Of course, you guys remember that the momentum is defined as the mass of the block times its instantaneous velocity. Let's look at a demo that illustrates this idea. Okay, so here's the first example. We have a block of 25 kilograms, or a cart of 25 kilograms, say, that is being acted on by some unknown constant force that acts for about 10 seconds. And let's see what happens. Uh, I have a vector here. This is the momentum of the cart. Here's the displacement of the cart. And down here you can see I've also got a graph of momentum versus time. And here I've got a graph of displacement versus time. Let's watch the thing for a second. That's good enough. And uh, I want you to notice <clears throat> that the momentum is increasing at a linear rate. Now remember that the net force times the change in time is the change in momentum. And since the momentum starts at zero, it increases at a constant rate. That's consistent with the constant force. How much force? Well, the net force is nothing other than the slope of the momentum versus time graph. And so we can read here at 10 seconds, we've got a momentum of about 20 kilogram meters per second, and that implies a force of approximately 2 newtons. So uh, what else can we get from this graph? Well, you know that the mass of the cart is 25 kilograms, and the final momentum here after 10 seconds was 20 kilogram meters per second. So from that you can get the speed, because you remember that the momentum is the mass times the velocity, and so the momentum divided by the mass must be the velocity. That's 20 divided by 25, that's about 0.8 meters per second. That's the final velocity, but of course the initial velocity is zero, and that means that the if you want to think about it this way, you could say that displacement is going to be the area under the velocity versus time graph. It's got a maximum of 0.8. Over here it's 0, so the area is going to be 1 half base times height. The height is 0.8, the base is 10, and half of 10 times 0.8 is 4 meters. So we expect the thing to have gone 4 meters. And so over here, if we read off at 10 seconds, how far is the thing gone? Sure enough, four meters. So it turned out perfectly, and uh, that's basically the example. Okay, the second example is a water wheel experiencing a constant torque. You guys know about water wheels. They sit in the water and they turn as a consequence of torques that are applied to them. And in this case, the physical principle is yet again Newton's second law, but this time it's the rotational form. So it's the change in the angular momentum is equal to the net torque times the change in time. Now, we learned about torque, rotational inertia, and so on last lesson. Today, just like uh, translational momentum is the mass times the velocity, remember I pointed out the, uh, the relationships between the translational quantities and the rotational analogs. Angular momentum is the rotational analog of momentum, of translational momentum. Rotational inertia is the rotational analog of mass. And angular velocity is the rotational analog of velocity. So this is nothing other than P equals mv dressed up in rotational terms. And uh, we have a demo that goes with this one as well. Okay, so here's another example, very similar to the first one, except this time we have a water wheel. Uh, it experiences a constant force. Uh, in the counterclockwise direction, which produces, by the right-hand rule, a constant torque pointing along the axis of rotation. Here I've made a green stripe in the side of the water wheel that's just there so you can see the angle through which the thing is rotating. And uh, down in this graph, I've got now, instead of momentum, I've got angular momentum. Instead of displacement, I've got angular displacement, or angle. Uh, 
And finally, the thing has a rotational inertia of 25 kilogram meters squared and some unknown constant force. So the idea is let's turn on the time and uh, I'll click here and that turns on the time and the thing starts to turn. Notice the angular momentum, the analog of the translational momentum is a vector that is pointing in the same direction of the, as the torque. If you remember the change in the angular momentum is the torque times the change in time. So the angular momentum is increasing in the direction of the torque. That makes sense. Also notice that the, uh, the thing is rotated through an angle of a little over pi over 2. And if you, re if you look here, whoops, what did I do? Um, if you look down here, you can see what angle is it going through. And it looks like it's about 1.64. That's a little over pi over 2, which is 1.57. Let's go ahead and try to rotate that so you can see it. We'll turn on the time again and watch it go. Notice it's going faster and faster. Its angular momentum is increasing linearly in time. And again, the, the slope of the angular momentum versus time graph is nothing other than the torque. It's exactly analogous to the example we just saw. And what is the torque? Well, it's going to be the slope. So we have a change of 20 kilogram meters squared per second in a time of 10 seconds. So that gives us a slope of uh, 20, uh, sorry, 2, 20 divided by 10 would be 2 kilogram meter squared per second squared. And uh, so it, everything comes out pretty much like the, uh, the translational version. What about how far the thing went? Well, again, the angular momentum is the inertia, the rotational inertia, which is 25 kilogram meters squared in a, an analog to the translational problem we did. So that means that at maximum of 20 uh, kilogram meters squared per second, we can divide that by the rotational inertia to get the angular velocity. Just like we divided the translational momentum by the mass to get the translational velocity, we can take the angular momentum divided by the rotational inertia to get the angular velocity. And again, it turns out to be 0.8 but this time it's radians per second instead of meters per second. And again, the area under the angular velocity versus time graph is going to be the angular displacement. It goes from 0 to 0 0.8. It has an average of 0.4 for 10 seconds. That means that it has an angular displacement of 4 radians. And let's look down here at the angular displacement at 10 seconds. Look into it, see if I can dial it in here. And you can see it's right at 4 radians. Okay, so this example is the exact analog of the one we just saw, but this time it's for rotation.